you guys and welcome back to another episode of the Jalart cast uh thanks for tuning in again and i hope you guys are always was as always sorry uh staying safe and creative wherever you are um i hope you've enjoyed the format the last couple of weeks uh the podcast guests that we've been bringing on and things we've been talking about a lot of great subject matter from recruiting to game development and of course always traditionally art is something we focused on for many many years now um also recently just as of this month um i kind of came off my LinkedIn by accident but um i'm now celebrating eight years doing the podcast so from 2016 till now um we've got to talk to some incredible people um really you know amazing guests you know from ian mccaig last year um scott robertson um, guys like that we've had everybody on we can really really think of at this point so <laughs> i'm running out of ideas but every now and again we get a gem that comes on and uh yeah we've got a a really great guest on today i think someone that you know, a lot of people have really kind of either asked for or have kind of seen in, in the mix that has been another podcast i thought we really want to get on here so Today, we're talking to uh, art director, artist, production designer, um, Jason Schreier. Hey, Jason, how's it going? Hey, going really well, Gordon. Um, really honored to be here. Uh, I love what you're doing with this podcast. And when I saw you had, uh, you know, mutual friends and had interviewed other production designer, art directors and concept designers in our industry. Uh, and I love what you were talking about. There's a lot of great topics here. and very pertinent slash relevant uh, topics that I can get down with. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm stoked about that to be here. So um, did you want me to just talk a little bit about who I am? And yeah, yeah. I mean, for anybody who doesn't know you right at this point. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so I've been um, working in animation specifically for the past uh, 17 years. And wow. uh, overall, in terms of design and being a concept artist, I've been doing that for 20 and I started off uh, as an illustrator and traditional artist, uh, like most of us do, you know, doing yeah. all the pen and ink and foundational and design and drawing. Um, and I actually have a fine arts background and then the fine arts transitioned to, into a traditional foundation illustration. Yep. Uh, and I've been, a, I'm not even going to go into the background of all the schools because <laughs> I, I kind of hid in school. That's my like main, <laughs> yeah. know, um, my parents are both in medicine. Uh, oh, right, okay. my, mom, my mom is a, a nurse and in, she's been in, in nursing for almost 50 years now, 60 years. Wow. Um, and she's been a nurse since she was 18. Um, and she's turning 75. So she's getting Jeez. up there and uh, she still works. So it's kind of amazing. My parents are hard workers. My mom, yep. my dad's still a doctor and he's a general practice doctor. Right. And uh, was an OBGYN during the 80s into the 90s. Okay. And so I was always around biology and, and human sciences and all those little elements of just design kind of came from those natural curiosities of seeing my parents do that kind of work. Right. And it's interesting because they were never, Hey, you can't do art. Like you should pick up the pen and draw. My mom was always like encouraging me to draw and to look at things around me and sort of observe and, you know, do those things. So those things were always embedded in my DNA per se. Yeah. I have an identical twin brother. That's not a lot of people know that about me is um, okay. my twin brother and I, um, I'm, we're only one minute apart. <laughs> and he's a anesthesia nurse. So he actually oh, is right. an anesthetist. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Interesting. So so cool. Your whole family basically is in medicine. You're kind of like, I say the black sheep of the family, but like, you know, <laughs> you, you know, you've, you went and done your own thing. Basically, you found your own path. Yeah, it's actually funny. I didn't know if I wanted to do art as a full time job either. I um, went to school for biology thinking I was going to go into medic medicine as well. Right. And I always found myself drawing these really detailed notes, almost like breakdowns of the body while I was in class. Right. Yeah. And one of my teachers was walking around and this was back in high school. Yeah. She's she's like, what is that? Like you, you're in human science, but you're like breaking down the, the like the head and the design of the head, like the the eyeballs and, the you know, the irises and the pupils and how everything interconnects to the brain. And oh, wow. Yeah. She's like, this is like medical. This is the medical, medical illustration. Level stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, you should do something with this. And she told me to go to Art Center. Right. And I was like, oh, I don't know what Art Center is. So I started doing research and mm -hmm. it seemed very intimidating because I had lived in Orange County my entire life and LA was like a world away. It was like over an hour yeah. away from wherever I lived. I had never been there. So yeah. I said, you know what? One of these weekends when I get my car, I was still, I think, 14 at the time. Mm -hmm. She's like, uh, you know, I encourage you to drive up there and just kind of see it and check it out. Right. And I remember driving up there and, see, and meeting Scott Robertson. Um, and yep. this was like very early when he just became the chair of entertainment design. And this oh, wow. is like, you know, like in the, you know, the early days early, in his career in there. Yeah. Early days there. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was just neat to see that. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I kind of floated around in different schools for a little while. I went to the art Institute of California, Orange County, got my bachelor's degree there. 
mm-hmm. graduated with honors, uh, studied um, animation actually. Yeah. And um, I have a, a character animation background. I can animate in 3D, I can animate in 2D. Right. Um, I could do storyboards. Uh, mm-hmm. I worked on short projects there a lot with friends. And actually a lot of the friends I made in that school became lifelong mates like Anthony, AJ Jones, Andrew Jones. Yeah. Um, and and like all my really amazing friends like uh, Kaylin Chalk and mm. uh, good buddies of mine like Jonathan Ryder, who went, went on to be an art director at Blizzard. His brother yeah. is an art director at Blizzard. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of my friends sort of stayed in the business and I mm. wasn't getting a job like right out of school. I, I was unhirable because I was sort of a generalist. Right. And I didn't know how to build a book yet. And so I just like said, here's my 3D animation reel hire right. me. And I sent it to Blizzard. I sent it to Obsidian, the Testa, mm-hmm. like all these game studios, because that's what was around me. It was game and, studios, yeah. and nobody wanted to talk to me. It was the weirdest thing. So I was like, yeah. all right, I got to find a job. So I was the kind of person where I can't sit idle. Yeah. So I kept working on my portfolio for a year after I graduated yeah. and got yeah. really serious. And I remember going to Art Center, back to mm-hmm. Art Center. And Scott's like, hey, you should come, you know, do something here. So I actually started yeah. taking night classes there. Mm-hmm. And studying at Art Center, and that was the best thing I ever did because my foundation all kind of came back, right? And I got really serious about concept art. Mm-hmm. And I had a teacher back at the Art Institute named Carlo Arleano, okay. and Carlo was sort of the guy who really set me in motion, like put my comet into orbit. Mm-hmm. And he was like, "Hey, dude, like you should be doing art and design for film or art and design for games." Yeah. And he was just so strong at like conceptual character design and like mm-hmm. object design and environment design. And he had a very well-rounded background. And that person was the sort of instrumental in getting me to go and be, you know, more serious about what I was doing. And I never looked back. I worked in games for a little while. I got hired by a friend uh, that felt bad for me. He's like, hey, dude, <laughs> I'm like sitting here at this like re- I was at a consulting ser- uh, service trying to like refinance homes. That's what I was doing. Right. And I got this call and he's like, hey, man, they got this junior concept artist position. Mm-hmm. It's at Shiny Entertainment. We're about to merge with the collective and we're going to make our own thing. Hey, you want to come over and do some games with us? And we're doing movie games. And I got hired under a lead artist named Sean O'Daniels, who's an amazing artist. He's a great illustrator. And yep. we shared an office together and he was wonderful. He was like very open with me and sort of shared all of his knowledge and techniques and whatnot. And I was like, crap, this is awesome. Like I'm learning how to like do concept art for games here. And mm-hmm. I worked on um, the Justice League video game. I worked on, uh, oh. they had, I think they just finished Golden Compass. Right. They did the Matrix there. They did Earthworm Gym there, which is actually really cool. Under all the favorite characters, yeah. Yeah, like yeah. all these amazing games. And um, there was just such, the collective, those guys were like the serious group that's right. merged with the shiny guys. Yeah. And the shiny guys were like, hey, they like animation. They like quirky stuff. Mm-hmm. And it was like the best environment to be in. I was only there for like six months, but right. it was the best six months of my life because I was such a sponge. I was it's soaking up right. all this like great info from both sides. And it was just yeah. like this perfect amalgamation and alchemy mm-hmm. happening in, under that same roof. Yep. And then uh, have you ever heard of Seagraph before? Yes. Yes. Yep. The, the event that happens yearly, I think at this point now, but yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So Seagraph is like about emerging technologies. Mm-hmm. And they always have a really great job fair there. For people that are looking for jobs, I highly encourage checking it out yeah. because all the major studios come there. And when they go to Seagraph, they're looking to hire people. It's it's not like a normal convention because they know that like us, the nerds are going to be there. Right. And yeah, they yeah. have like a serious, you know, affirmation to get a job in the specific field. Yep, yep. So I brought my book with me. I had this like physical portfolio and I gave it to DreamWorks Animation because mm-hmm. I've always wanted to work there. I saw Prince of Egypt. And oh, I saw yeah. like these beautiful background paintings that were done traditionally in 2D. And I said, that's what I want to do. Yeah. If there's some way to bust into that. And it was like the works of Paul Lassane and Derek Gogol and, you right. know, Lorenzo Martinez and all these amazing layout artists and yep. Marcos Mateo. And, I, oh, yeah. and I'm like a weirdo. Like I study the background. Like if I see a background, I'm like, I like that background. I'm going to find out who that is. Right. And, and I'll like go the kind of reverse engineer the look and see yeah. who those people are. Yep. And um, you have to put in that effort, man. Like if you want to work in a field, you have to sort of dissect and sort of understand who and what and where and how all those like ideas. I do that with together. so much stuff. People think I'm such a nerd sometimes, Jason, where the fact that like I can literally look at a painting and be like, oh, that's Max Staffenport or that's uh, my gazer. Or that's, like people are like, how the fuck do you know that? I'm like, just you can see it in their style. It's like you, my my eye is so well trained for that stuff. Yeah. You, you have to. And I think that as a... Uh, 
production designer now that I've kind of, I'm kind of going, I'm skipping forward. Yeah. Uh, you, you have to be a fan of the people you hire. Too. Yeah. And I never was in a position to hire as a, I was a, a junior artist. Mm -hmm. I really, truly worked the ranks. Like I went yep. from super junior to like very intermediate journeyman and right. to a layout background supervisor and then to yeah. production design art direction, you know, yeah. I mean, and that that, that, was, that's, I'm, I was going to say that's that's just like a, a thing that I think with this industry, if you're if you're driven enough and you're good enough, like you can rock it really, really quickly up the ranks. You can. And I didn't, you know, I didn't feel ready. And uh I've had opportunities in the past. Uh I was working on Smallfoot actually, just jumping forward to Warner Animation Group. Mm -hmm. And a good friend of mine approached me, and funny you, you mentioned this. There was a movie mm -hmm. with Ian McKeg. Right. And he was the producer and the director on it. Oh, wow. And he's like, hey, I need a production designer. Will you come work with me? And I actually went to the Sony lot mm -hmm. and I was ready to do it. And the sh the project got shut down. Oh. So, you know, well, there's an honor though for Ian to ask you because I mean, Ian, you know, what I mean, like yeah. at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, it was kind of amazing in itself, you know. Yeah. I um, mean, like even, even the fact that you're doing production design now, because I think sometimes people can work their whole careers and never even get that job because it's such a high level job because you're obviously setting the tone for like everything that's been seen. Yes. Yeah. And it's it's a weird job too because it's such a thankless task in a lot of ways. <laughs> it's Art uh, in general is a thankless task. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's so hard. And yep. it's it's crazy because there's so many things nobody talks about. Yeah. That are like there's the painful side of it where you know you're trying to have these conversations sometimes with people that are less motivated to make things awesome. Right. And and they're just like, hey, here's the money. Like figure it out yeah, right? yeah where other people are like hey i want to be creative with you i get jacked on art and i'm really excited about learning and working with you and yeah there's just so many different types of people and i think that having those human skills in the past working in a consultancy and yeah. you know in in, a, in loans and working in a medical background mm -hmm. you get people that are dealing with life and death on one yeah. side yeah. And then you get one side where it's like, hey, I really just want to be a collaborator and make a great thing with you and make beautiful stuff. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's always a balance. And I think the thing I've suffered from early on in this career, because I think when I had my previous career, because I've worked in stuff like sales and desk jobs, and then obviously I was an engineer for years and years. And my people skills are off the chart. Like, that's something I really worked on for a long, long time. I can talk to anybody. I can tell. Podcast. Yep. Um, and my passion for the industry, you know, like the books behind me where I have hundreds of dissect this stuff. I know yeah. people's work by eye. But then it's like the hard bit I've found is trying to marry the technical skill. So bringing that up to yeah. par to match also, because you can have people like me who are super passionate, very knowledgeable about the industry, know a lot of people, very good people skills. But then yeah. if you aren't hitting the technical bar, it's hard to then push past that, that, that throne. It's so I guess. true. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, there's so many different like mindsets. There's the artistic organic, and then there's the technical, very like, Hey, let's break this thing down and be methodical about the process. Left brain, right brain, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and you know what? You have to have both to do this job. Yes, and and uh, and I didn't know I was both really until I did it. Yeah. And it, I think I I might have said this before to you, but I think that you kind of know the job before you know the job. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like you're in your seat, you're talking, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you have the answers to something. And you're like, hey, I don't know how I got that answer, but I guess it's just because of experience and just talking about this stuff for so long. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I actually have been in enough conversations where in meetings and mm -hmm. I was, you know, you're the subordinate. So yeah. you're sitting there and you're a listener and mm -hmm. sponging. Yeah. And I remember situations where I could have raised the flag so many times with the answer, but yeah. because of my position, I couldn't say anything. Right. Yeah. And I remember in my head during those moments, I was like, when those opportunities come, I'm going to be the one that say, "Hey, I have the answer to that. How can I help?" Yeah, and let's let's work this stuff out together and be in a workshop and open spitball ideas. Yeah, and I think that's the key, guys. Like I, everyone out there that's really listening to this, I, mm. if I'm going to pass along any you know gems, one of the gems I can say is be patient. You'll have your time, mm -hmm. and when you do have your time, you're going to shine because people are going to really hear you. Mm -hmm. And they're going to care about what you have to say because they respect that. And yeah. I think it's all about that investing the time, you know, putting yeah. the time away and, and just knowing when, when to say stuff too. I think yeah. uh, there's a patience level for that too. Like you can't jump ahead or behind. You got to let people finish. Read the room. Yeah. Read the room. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's like, it's probably I'm in a new position as well where the studio I'm in just right now, there's only like five or six people. So like 
as an indie dev, like you get that more experience of being able to like have a voice heard because there's only like five of you in a meeting, right? So that's not like you're dealing with departments and managers and loads of people. Right. Um, but like, yeah, that's that's a good thing, I think, to always think is that when you get in those situations, it's trying to remember to take in as much as you can. Because sometimes maybe even the thing where you think you have the answer, but then someone might bring up something even better because you're listening. You're like, oh, God, that was even better. Like, I did not even thought of that. So like, yeah, and then right. the years of experience and then building up to it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're absolutely right. And it's it's kind of cool. It's like a surprise to yourself sometimes. You're like, oh, yeah, shit. like, oh, shit, I never thought of that. Yeah, it's really good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, you've done so many years of the animation, like, and films that, you know, some stuff you never saw the light of day and things you worked on that never got published. But like, I mean, yeah. now you're doing like the big budget stuff. And obviously, like the fact that like, you know, you were doing all the stuff on the side as well, they got you noticed by Netflix to do by Samurai. I mean, that was a whole conversation yeah. in itself. But I mean, the idea of like the way the industry was back then, do you feel it was kind of the same as it is now? Or do you feel like the, the skill level has went way past what you felt was initially really what people were looking for like 10 years ago? That's such a great question. Um, uh, I'll slow down and answer that one because... Mm -hmm. It's it's jumped. I think every year animation has grown, and yeah. it, and if you really look at it in like sort of a, a technical numbers format, um, it makes up almost eighty percent of the space of entertainment. Okay. And yeah. people don't realize that. Like people do love live action stuff, no doubt. I mean, yeah. But if you want to capture an entire family and you want to motivate people to get to the theater and still be appeased, yeah. animation sort of satisfies all those urges. Mm -hmm. um japan for example has been making adult animation for years you well, know? i mean exactly yeah i mean like yeah, yeah. But i mean like, even beyond that like a lot of the the anime stuff that i grew up on like um ninja scroll and you know all the production id stuff like i yeah. grew up on i grew up on that stuff like i had a friend that worked at a blockbuster video and uh he used to let me borrow like all the like japanese animes i watched all of them Oh, Gundam as well, stuff like that. Oh, yeah, you know? Gundam, yeah, yeah, Voltron, yeah. like all yeah, that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And even yeah. um, Transformers was a Japanese IP before it became Transformers. Yep. And so I, you know, to me, uh, th that stuff is just catching up finally in a good way. That's why, like, yes. I think Blue Eye Samurai was born, was people were yeah. craving for a US-based uh, sort of uh, IP to be created that's something that's new. And, you know, mm -hmm. fortunately, I was in the right place at the right time on an amazing project and i got a chance to work with some incredible people um and craft a world around it and yeah and, and that one i didn't expect it to be as big of a success as it was to be honest with you i think yeah love death and robots and all of those short format anthology series like came that came from heavy metal you know if you really right. look at it, that's yeah i grew up watching heavy metal and then love death and Rob robots is our generation is sort of the black mirror for animation yeah. and and I was like, holy shit, that is what I've been waiting for my entire life to work on something like that. Yeah. And I, at that time, I was working on Darkmouth. I don't know if you're familiar with this project. No. So Alcon Entertainment, they are amazing small animation startup, basically. But they came mm -hmm. from making big blockbuster live action movies. And they were doing yeah. their very first animated movie, mm -hmm. which is, by the way, is still getting made. So I can't say too much about it. <laughs> um, Rob Ruppel who mm -hmm. was the art director on Spider-Verse, right. hired me to be his art director on that project. And that's mm -hmm. where I got my first role as an art director. So I owe a lot to Rob Rupel in bringing me in. Mm -hmm. And and Rob and I, we designed that entire movie. So he basically yeah. left a little early, but I stayed on. He, they made me production designer mm -hmm. on that project. And I hired um, a, a team around me, a few people. It was a very small team. I think we had under five artists on that show. And usually in animation, it goes up to 20 people. Yeah, there's a lot, market. yeah. But um, even on Transformers 1, just to jump around, mm -hmm. we only have nine people, including myself, in the en entire art department. So with people, I want to say this out loud because a lot of people are saying, hey, nobody's hiring. Mm -hmm. They are hiring, but they're hiring less people now. Right. And, and that's something I've seen from my days at DreamWorks. Where, right. And, and it was interesting because... When I was hired on Kung Fu Panda at the very tail end of that, mm -hmm. they were just f finishing up on Monsters vs. Aliens and David James was production designer on that. He had mm -hmm. a team of like, it was stacked, dude. Like there was 20 art directors on that movie. And these are people that became production designers later. It was the yeah. most amazing art department I've ever seen. And these are people like, these are serious hitters, man. This is like Patrick Hannenberger, who is now oh, okay. a production designer on like yeah, yeah, yeah. The Lego movies and stuff. Oh, yeah. And then Ron Kurnia one, who is a production designer on Smallfoot and was on Monkeys of Mumbai, who's an amazing illustrator, best one of my best friends. 
right, then okay. um, all these amazing dudes like Michael Isaac, who was an art director on that, yeah. who's a production designer at Sony. Yep. Richard Daskus, who was an art, a viz dev artist on that, who became mm. a production designer. So mm. it's just these it, Scott Wills, you know, yeah, oh, yeah. Of like, come on. So yeah. being around that at DreamWorks, mm. I learned so much. Mm. And it was like, you didn't even like honestly have to try to learn. They were just so good that you yeah. have to work. It was like, it was like Hunger Games. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. It was like literally Ooh. Hunger Games. Yeah, like yeah, I like yeah. better step it up or I'm gonna die. You know. Yeah, uh, next on the chopping block. But yeah, yeah. I mean, like adult animation has been a thing for me. For I mean, uh, I grew up on Saturday morning cartoons as, as like we just talked about in an anime, and you know, watching a lot of the Toriyama stuff, Dragon Ball back in the day, and, and Akira, Ghost in the Shell. You know, like oh, all yeah. that stuff that fed my imagination. But funny enough. Back in 2002, 2003, and Del Toro talks about this as well, was discovering Avatar The Last Airbender and yep. Mike and Brian's whole production on that, how they went from Invader Zim and Nickelodeon to pitch this whole thing about a boy and his dog and like the elements and stuff. And that, you know, obviously the live action just landed on Netflix and I uh, have mixed reactions about it. But because um, I think it's, it's hard to transition one from one medium to another. That's always the difficult That's thing. Right. Um, but then now that Avatar Studios has been formed and Mike and Brian are working again with Nickelodeon, the next iteration of Avatar will be coming soon, hopefully, in the next couple of years. And like, I feel they were doing something adult back then, even yes. you know, twenty years ago. That has been carried through. I think every animation since, even when they got to do Korra, which was then mm -hmm. above and beyond that. So it's always weird watching the original Avatar how it's in four by three format. <laughs> Remembering that it was made for TVs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like how old I am. Um, but like, yeah. So um, but then like, yes, the, the, that animation and that art style and that production value has really driven what was eventually to become my career and yeah, yeah making exactly. Ryan and a huge thing yeah i've had a chance to see uh some of the avatar stuff because i'm over at paramount oh of and, course right yeah, yeah and they have a uh, avatar studios which is in burbank and yeah uh, a few of my friends are over there yeah um, i don't know if you're f um, familiar with jake pannon um, no no he's he's stupid good like he's yeah. uh, he's a production designer on that and he mm -hmm. came from sony and right. work on like you know Mitchell's versus the machines and I can only imagine after all the success those both the series have had that they're hiring only with the best now yeah it's it's so insane they had uh, Alex Constad on there and, okay and Alex and I are good friends and Alex was the art director now he's over at Netflix working at Adult um so they're working on some new I can't say what he's working on yeah, yeah, yeah. all stuff. I have to say <laughs> is anything Alex is doing it's, it's fucking insane. Like it's yeah. always insane. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm buddies with Rafa Gazzetti, and uh, he's okay. also in, he's over at Netflix now as well. So like, okay. yeah, the, Netflix is starting to just pinch people from every side of the, the industry. Like they're just yeah, they've got the budget right, they've got the money. So it's like yeah, they do, and you know they they're taking risks, and in a way they kind of hurt us too. Like I I can <laughs> say this because I worked there and I saw I was there during the gold rush. We call it the right, gold okay, rush. yeah, and. Uh, you know, they were putting a stake down in every single corner of every facet of animation yeah. and um, they overspent. And it's very, you know, it's unfair. To, it's fair to say this because at the time mm -hmm. during the pandemic, nobody was doing live action. The world right. shut down. You know, everybody was it was like, oh, crap, what's the next median that we can work in to create film? Yeah. And so like Blue Eye Samurai was born and all these these shows were born because there was like real serious storytellers that we're finding a new space and they're like, how do we elevate this environment? And yeah. so, you know, they were thinking of things more optically and, you know, like, uh -huh. Hey, we're doing this through a real lens. We're doing real staging. We're doing real lighting. It's, um, and it's different because I didn't think that way. I always thought animation was actually, this is my opinion, but yeah. I always thought animation's way more crafted than live action yes. because you, nothing is for free. Yeah. Everything you in the design, world. every bucket, every stool, every bar stop. Yeah. Yeah it's, yeah, it's down to the bolt and the nut on the table. And I always say yeah. this, and I want to remind people that this is real cinema. Like, it mm -hmm. is not a genre at all. And yeah. I love that Guillermo del Toro said that when he was working on Pinocchio. He's yeah. like, animation is cinema. And yeah. now it's becoming, you know, there's still <laughs> this weird thing that happens even at the Academy when they're talking about the Oscars and stuff. They're like, oh, hey, here's that little kid section of our yeah. stuff. And it's like, yeah. no, no, no. Like we're doing, ser we've been doing serious stuff for a very long time. Yep. And I think it deserves a lot more respect. And yeah. um, I've worked in, an, I've worked in live action. I worked in the theme park design and VR yeah. space. And mm -hmm. I still have more fun in animation than any other medium.
at the same day. Yeah, I mean, like it's one of these things. Like we, we talked, we talked about this with my partner. We were talking about because we're, we're metal heads, so we're into metal. But the fact that the Grammys only have one genre for metal and one award kind of like category, whereas like R and B and then mostly country pop and rock yeah. all have like five or six categories within different things. So like even with the Oscars, it's like yeah, animation is almost just one singular thing. And even the the movies that were up this year, I mean, Boy in the Heron, I've not seen it yet, but I've obviously been told it's really great. Sorry. But the other films that were in that category, I was like, you know, that every one of these should probably should have won some type of award. Um, mm-hmm. But you only get best animation. You don't even get like best sound animation. So it's like, yeah, it's one of these things where I just wish that, you know, and Del Toro, I'm, I'm hoping and other guys like that, because my buddy Glenn worked on Del Toro's Pinocchio. He worked with some of the, the, the puppet makers and stuff. But he was just saying that it took them, that was 10 years getting that, that film off the ground. Because like, you know, oh, sure. it just like nobody was buying the IP. Nobody was like, why do we need this? You know, but like Del Toro, I think obviously now, Having done stuff like Hellboy and other films, he was like, you had that fan behind him that people were like, okay, you can make something cool. Mm. But his belief and, you know, just believing in animation is, is something that we really need to keep in the industry and yeah. not let it die with people who stop making films or move on. Um, even with Favreau, right? I mean, like, Without he obviously like, cut his teeth on animation as well as doing live action and, like, such a Star Wars nerd and, like, the whole oh, thing from Amando. Yeah. But then even if you look at, like, Dave Filoni, who was my gazer, he was one of the guys who worked with Matt, and Dave then worked, he started, he done, he done Avatar The Last Airbender, and then he worked in um, Clone Wars, you know, like, so, yeah. uh, with Matt. So, like, yeah, so, the, you know, people who have came from the animation background are going into live action, um, it totally changes the, the landscape, right? It does. And you learn so much. I, I, I will speak a little bit about Transformers. Um, we're working with Industrial Light and Magic, and as our production um client and actually um, friendship, you know, it's a more of a collaboration yeah. than anything else. It's really, yeah. we've, we've created a, a true partnership between Paramount and ILM. Yeah. Um, I will say that it's a dream come true mm-hmm. and it's everything I've ever thought it was going to be and more. Yeah. And the people that I'm working with, um, I would have to, I have to say sort of a swan song thing happened. I get a little emotional about this one actually, because we worked with Singapore and they okay. shut down recently and yep. they did on on Transformers One Singapore, it's their magnum opus. Like right. they legit put everything that they have in because they knew they were shutting down. Yeah. And when and they were still they were working harder on their shots than they had ever done before because they knew that they needed to do the most amazing thing before they yeah. closed the studio. And you felt it. Like when yeah, we were on calls with Alex Pritchard, who was our VFX supervisor in uh-huh. Singapore. Mm-hmm. he it was like it was like a one and done like they would yeah, get stuff yeah. like in the first shot it was approved that's how yeah, good they were yeah and i mean the asian market in general is just yeah you it's know. just it was it was amazing and i and getting a chance to work with them because we i got to go to stagecraft mm-hmm. we went to uh to over to sydney into mm-hmm. australia and we've been working with um uh, fraser churchill who is our okay. VFX supervisor who vfx supervised scott pilgrim and he is just incredible. Like the his team, everybody he works with, um, Alex Fry and and A Popescu and all these amazing artists, uh, Gene Chi. These guys are legends in their field. And a lot of them, they're doing animation for the first time, and they're killing it. Like yeah. they've worked on Mando and all these amazing shows. And you know, I I knew already because they're in the VFX world. It's it's computer graphics design. Mm. So they already they're already doing animation, but they didn't know it yet. They're yeah. like, they're doing animation, but for live action plates. Yeah. And I'm like, but how do we take what you're doing and sort of craft it? And not saying it's not crafted before, but craft it in a way that fits into yeah. this genre, but also play to all the strengths and to all the weaknesses of that pipeline. And I got to say, they knocked it out of the park. And I'm very excited about Ultraman, too, because I got a chance to work on Ultraman as well. Yep. And it is. I just saw it uh, like two weeks ago. It's going to be at Annecy in June. Okay. It's incredible. Yeah. It's a, it's a game changer for animation. Yeah. So there's two big I'm so excited about these two projects. I really hope that the world can Just see hype up the world for animation. You know, it's, it's like it's even, exciting. It's yeah, very exciting. I mean, even the the left field like knockout punch for me was like I mean, I'd seen Sausage Party and it was what it was, but then for Seth to go and back the turtles like yeah. and I was like, where did that come from? But he was like, dude, like I've loved the turtles forever. Like it's been a dream project. I mean, to get a turtles movie made, and I was like, what? And right off the, I think that was actually right off the back of Spider Verse when that was coming as well. So same team, same market. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, 
if, if they can just get more of these heavy hitters just to fling these huge banners like yep. you know, like Transformers, Turtles, Spider Man, like just keep flinging them. It's like you know, the more money that we get for the box office, the more you can sit in people and say, "Well, look, look at all these numbers. Look at all this money we're making. We can make more stuff." Um, but then, yeah, it's like the the ever evolving of the line must go up because like the first friends I made in the industry was Blizzard guys because. I was a huge Warcraft fan, so when I did everybody and from LinkedIn and stuff, it was all the guys from Blizzard. Um, and sitting watching a couple of my friends like taking pictures on their Instagram, and being like, "Oh, dude, Phil Spencer's here! Like he's throwing us a party for the merger and blah blah blah." And I'm sitting there like, "Oh, okay." Then, and then like two weeks later, rug from under their feet, and I was like, oh. "Jesus Christ!" Yeah, like, you know, to sit there and and stand in front of those guys and be like, "You're part of the Xbox family! Congratulations!" And then, <laughs> like, just. I mean, and then animation, obviously. Like, I think you posted up about like DreamWorks and stuff as well, and things that are happening there and you know and i've seen people talking about a couple of guys that worked on the what if series they've done a kind of podcast money thing as well where they've talked about the ebbs and flows of the industry but they were like it can't sustain like this forever we can't just like keep making productions and then firing whole teams and then hiring them back again and because you get yeah. that actual 10 percent of people like leads and, and seniors who will get laid off and just leave the industry altogether and never come back and you yeah, lose like, all that experience yeah you're it's a piggyback off what you're saying um the, going back to Netflix, like during mm. the pandemic, they hired everybody. They were, mm. they were, all the other studios were sort of losing all their major, major players. And mm. they were sort of this giant black hole in the mm -hmm. middle of the industry, just sucking all this talent in. Mm. And they told everybody, this is a place for creators. This was a yeah. place for um, artists so they can actually have voices. Yeah. And so that, that motivated me to want to go there. I was so motivated. And everybody else that I had worked around were like, we're going there, we're going there. So it was like this amazing mm -hmm. buzz around the studio. Yeah. But then right after the pandemic, they're like, wait, we can't keep all these IPs. And so every, all these like amazing starships got spit back out into space. Oh, and yeah. so there's a lot of these giant star destroyers just sitting up there in space right oh. now, hovering, waiting for the next thing. Yeah. And we're in a weird spot right now. I think it's going to take at least a year or maybe mm -hmm. even a little bit longer for the industry to sort of stabilize. Yeah, there are going to be big tentpole projects no matter what. And we were yeah. just talking about this before we went live about sequels. And yeah. people are super afraid to invest in new IP right now. You're going to see a lot more sequels being greenlit, mm -hmm. less uh, original content, less, less established IP, IP stuff people know. Yeah. Yeah. It has to be established. Or if it's, if it's like a best selling novel yeah. or, you know, something that's already had a bread and butter or a stake and a claim to it. Yeah. Uh, you'll see a lot of young adult novels starting to sort of emerge do as well oh, because yeah, working yeah. at IP that have best their bestseller status yep. and they're like hey let's make a series out of that so that's yeah, starting yeah. to happen too as well yeah. you know yeah. yeah and it's one of these things I think that ugh, fair enough I mean I think the last time I spoke to an economist in LA he was he was talking about like the two to three year mark where he was thinking 26 27 you might see like a resurgence of people getting hired on mass again but the next couple of years at least he feels will be really bumpy as everything just like sells and yeah. Follows them, evens out again so um but then again you know i'm, I'm speaking to the guys at mtvs on a couple of weeks you know stag at a point as well for his new studio um but then it's like a thing where the guys who have now left are making the roads out of where they were and forming these new studios i'm hoping they're going to be built off the back of we don't want to repeat of where we were we want to make something new take those lessons that we learned and try and make a more um less toxic more envi inviting environment and, and a, pe a place people can kind of grow old and because like you know the, the industry i came from an engineer and like you could have probably had that job from when you started at 16 or 18 till you died you know like you were you were there you worked like you're like your mother you know like working in a job for 40 50 years yeah um what i found actually there was a, a, a singapore uh national kind of gallery where the government and was kind of getting pitched on the idea that people who are leaving college right now in their 20s there needs to be a fun set up for them nationally so when they hit 40 they can retrain again because of things like ai the world is moving so quickly now, you can't really stay in the same job forever. You know what I mean? It's really yeah. short-lived. And I feel that's it's, the thing with animation. It's always been is that you're jumping from one pole to the next. You know what I mean? It's true. Yeah. I And going into the AI factor, I feel like all the major studios and uh, not so much Paramount, they're not talking about it at all. Actually, they're against it. Um, yeah. They're, I'm talking about Netflix. I'm talking about some of these studios, um, I'm starting to hear whispers of them using that as a tool. Oh, I've seen a couple of news and people are talking about it already. They're hiring people for first day of like pre-production oh, yeah. pre stuff. Yeah, yeah. And it's a it's a bummer. I don't I don't like how much they're pushing that as an agenda. Uh, it, it's it's on my Instagram now. Like it's like use Meta, like you search with Meta AI, and 
yeah. you know, going on LinkedIn and you see everything's AI based. And yeah. I'm a little bummed out, man, because mm. I don't think we need it. I, I think that it's a innovate, it's emerging technology mm-hmm. that has become a forerunner now. And mm-hmm. yes, it does make amazing. Sora makes great results, but yeah. it is, to, in my opinion, it lacks soul. It, it's, it's it's soulless. Um, it lost. It loses its grit. You know, yeah. it, it just becomes this smooth, perfectly calculated. You know, and I know you can obviously prompt things to be a certain way, but I don't care. Like I'm not going to jump on that bandwagon. Our stuff's supposed to be perfect. It. No. Yeah. And the the, the that, dead thing you're slow are the things that make things beautiful. I mean. Yeah. 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 I I've, I mean, I've talked to uh, Mache about it a little bit, and you know, I there's parts of it I do understand why people get it and use it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's parts of it where I find like, oh, hey, this could be something potentially unique. Yeah. But the, my problem with it is the unethical part of it and how it's scraping oh, yeah. images from us. And yeah, yeah, I mean, the scary thing about Facebook and Instagram is they've been collecting our images for years. Yep. And they have this huge, huge archive of our faces and all of the places we've been to and all the food we've eaten. Photos of our kids, photos of our photos relatives. Of our children, yeah, just yeah. Things, our pets. It's it's ridiculous and it's really yeah. unethical. And mm-hmm. I'm having a huge problem with that. And I think that um, it makes it's made me want to almost like get off of social media a few times. Yeah. My brother is not on social media. My, no, my I can imagine brother, why, like, yeah. Fuck social media. Like, I do not yeah. want to be a part of it. If yeah. people want to reach me, they can give me a call. They know my number. Dude, the amount of work I've got since I switched social media off, like, I mean, I, I'm I'm just like so stereotypical through my, I'm learning this now, like I'm, I'm turning 40 next year, right? So, but then I've learned this all through my 30s is that I was sucked into that machine for so long and really b- chasing every clout and every, you know, arguing people, you know, during the Black Lives Matter when I was arguing people about that movement and everything and then try to get the podcast set up around that and people, you know, giving me shit and arguing people online. It got to a point where I was just like so sick of it. And I had this conversation really early on with Corey Loftus and Corey was talking about, you know, when AI really struck, he was like, what the fuck is going Because at the time I was also part of a movement with Carl Ortiz and Steven Zapata and they were going to like the government with all this stuff. And Corey was like, what the fuck is happening? And I'm like, dude, like, here's all the information I know. Go have a wee look. See but he just was like, overnight. He was like, I can't fucking believe this. Like every single thing I've ever drawn for Disney. And it's just on there. And people are prompting it. And they're prompting my, they're prompting my name and my style. And yeah. it's just, oh, it, it, it physically makes me nearly want to cry and give shivers at, up my back when the people who are my heroes who have grown up making this stuff are now in a position where they're afraid for not only their safety, but also their career. And it's like a thing of, the shift that has happened in the world, it's just something that we've never had to deal with. I mean, like, if you look at my generation as millennials, you know, we've had to deal with nearly three global recessions, a pandemic, and possibly now a war. So it's like, it's such a crazy time right now. We talk about art and making and production, but like, it's hard to then create when the world around you is like so toxic because you're using most of your energy just to survive, right? Which is crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah I can I can speak to that too. It's um important to use that energy that's around you for the positive. And yep. I know it's so easy. There has to be a balance, right? There has to be a way to take that toxicity and negativity and turn it into a positivity. Mm-hmm. And it's a conscious effort and and work to do that. Yeah. Um, and this is something I say to students all the time. I, I'm working with a, a lot of high schoolers um, at Sisler Create, which is a school that's in Canada. Oh, yeah. in and um, I get on with them, you know, monthly and we talk about their project and we talk about mental health all the time. That's something that not a lot of yeah. people talk about. And yeah. we're very aware of it. And, you know, the socio dynamic economic climate that we're in right now, and physiologically, we're all getting taxed by that. And I think that as a evolutionary thing, as we are human beings in this world, we have to be more understanding of what's really going on and cognitive of those surroundings. Mm-hmm. And I think that, um, you know, for, for you and I talking about this is really important stay positive, stay hungry, still, still be pot passionate about what you do and love what you do every single yeah. day, make an effort to do it. Cause it's too easy to be um, destroyed by all this negativity around you. Yeah. That's AI what feeds is the machine. part of that. I feel like yeah. it's a huge factor, you know? Yeah. It's funny as well with a lot of the bad actors in the space as well, because I've watched a lot of documentaries and read a lot of books on like the last progress from, you know, when I originally was involved in that NFT project up until the crypto space. And you see everybody who was initially involved in NFT who moved to crypto and then everyone who's in crypto moved to AI. It's like, you know, it's mm. the next Ponzi scheme. It's the next, because even now, like AI, you know, we've, I've now talked with enough serious people, including guys like Feng Zhu, who, you know, have talked about 
how it can't really take your job how it really at this point is just like a dream machine it's not really at the point where it's going to do anything like production worthy you know it's making pretty pictures everyone can do that to an extent it's the detailed mechanical function problem solving stuff that really is where but it will in that mix yeah well this is the thing what he's saying is the now but then i don't know years from now but the the thing is the experts i've spoke to the guys who are separate from the industry who just work on ai are like it's almost like like open ai and these companies are over promising you look at stable diffusion right and their ceo who's just left and that's went bankrupt like it really is like a hollow shell of something that they're promising that can't be delivered and the guys i know who are talking about like the singularity and the conscious ai they're like that's like 60 years away like we're nowhere near that like it can make you a schedule or like a dietary plan on open ai but it can't do anything worthy of work um yeah for a long time it, yeah. it, it can and it can't i think it's um like we were talking about tools um mm-hmm. you know if you want to do a singular object and right. you want to craft the world around a singular object or hey you want to get something for a pitch this yeah. is where we get hurt because yeah. you know this is the this is the place that you need to be cognizant of is mm-hmm these, a lot of directors don't want to hire artists. It's easier for them to have like a bunch of prompts that they write down for sequences that they're going to be pitching for a movie, go into mid journey, go into stable division, whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. background they're using. um, And then run that prompt and then have something as a visual to talk to the studios about instead of actually hiring an artist to do it. And I'm seeing that happen. I've, I've had people that are directors Mm. and I'm not going to name names, pitch AI (laughs) to me. And I'm like, Oh, this is happening way too often now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm like, I don't want to do art for you because Mm -hmm. I automatically know that you're going down that pigeonhole and I'm not going to jump in that hole with you. You know, it's just to me, it's a, it's kind of divisive and it's a little bit, um, it's like shooting ourselves in the foot and I don't want to shoot myself in the foot. I want to stay in my Mm -hmm. lane, still craft things for my imagination. Look at all these amazing books that, you know, you and I have and, do that yeah. research and then use those images and ideas and, and inject them back into our work. Yeah. And I may be a little bit of a dinosaur and come to the game late if it mm-hmm. does end up going that direction, but I might be the last person to hold out. Yeah, but you'll still have your fucking soul intact. You'll still have your morals. <laughs> your compass will not be unchanged. You know, you'll still have some kind of like level of pride. Like I'm not saying people who use it are soulless. Like, I mean, whatever. Like no. if you experiment with it, okay, Fine. cool, right? You know, but yeah. like I think it's just the integrity of always being like, you know, integrity. Yes. Yeah. Like the, the thing I've always chose to do has always been the more difficult path. But like, look, if I wanted to stay in my job and earn whatever I earned back in the day and, and work in a job where it was soulless and I can collect my paycheck and go home and play video games. Sure. I could have done that for the rest of my life, but I wanted to change and be better and do something interesting with my life. And so I think it's one of these things where you have the choice in front of you, like, you know, and I think as long as people at your level, like you and Corey and other people and Raf and stuff are, are turning around and saying to people, we don't want to use that. We don't, you know, then the studios get to a point where, because I mean, I spoke to the Renee the other day, who's a, a solo game developer, but she's worked for other big triple A's and she was saying, the thing with AI is that like, especially for game production, if you say to someone like, here's $20 million to make a game, right? Yeah. And you're saying with AI, you can save $10 million. The studio will then be like, cool. We'll spend the other 10 million doing even better features. And, you know, like the same when we had the conversations about Naughty Dog recently with Neil and stuff, how he was saying that, you know, that they're trying to eliminate the, cr- the crunch culture by, you know, planning stuff a bit better out. But then if you plan stuff and everything runs on time, then you're like, oh, great, we've got an extra five hours. We can just make extra stuff. Like you never stop. You know, as an artist, as a production team, you're never worried too much about the budget. You'll have to stay in budget, obviously. But like the more money you have, you're always going to use that to just make something better. Because at the end of the day, that's what you want to do is make the best thing you possibly can. That's true. Yeah, it's a it's about the final outcome and it's about being, you know, part of a team. Yeah. And uh, at the end of the day, I just want to work with cool people and I want to mm-hmm. be around projects that are inspirational. Yeah. And and that's a really hard thing to find now because there's yeah. just so few and far between. And fortunately, on many of the projects I've worked on, I've been blessed in that sense where people want to make something different that makes a wave that stands out and is unique. Mm-hmm. And uh, Transformers was my chance to sort of create my own visual look on a movie and uh, working with Josh Cooley is a dream come true because he just trusts his team. Mm -hmm. He's working with P he puts the best people around him in a place where they could be their best. Mm -hmm. And he is a sponge as well. And he's learning from us and is truly invested in that process of seeing, Hey, people evolve into the best that they could possibly be. And you get great ideas that way. You're in a room with someone and there's an open format. People share people, you know, give and, Sometimes you just go, hey, I don't have an ego. I'm just here to get the best possible result on the screen. And all of us are doing that. And I think we can yeah. feel that every day when we're working on the movie, you know? Yeah. 
I think also as we band together as a people as well as like a, a collective art form, you know, like the actors did when they, when they had the strikes last year, it's a thing of like, the studios may hold some element of power, but then at the end of the day, we are the people that work for them and make the things they want. Oh, yeah. So like, yeah, we really have to. And again, it's why I think after the mass layoffs, we're now talking about unionization and try to get that all involved. I mean, animation's had unions for a long, long time. So yep. um, the games are still fresh out of the gate. So they're still figuring a lot of that stuff out. But of course. I think the more we collect together, I think the safer we'll be. I think it's a, you know, unionizing is so important. It's, it's, it's a very old, you know, tradition to be a, in part of a union. Um, mm -hmm. It goes back to, you know, the early 20s. But I, yeah. I think thinking about this in terms of animation, mm -hmm. uh, 839 is is our union, local 800, 839. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to, we're going to, we're going into negotiations very soon. And the studios are going to need to speak up about what their mm -hmm. stance is on, you know, AI and all the things we were discussing. Uh, there's going to be some serious topics happening here very soon in June, in July. Um, and we may go striking, you know, and that's yeah. one of those things where, Hey, what do we do? What do we, you know, what is the next step here for our business? And yeah. I think that it needs to happen. If it needs to happen, it needs to happen. Um, it's going to hurt the economy, of course. Yep. Uh, and it's one of those things where it's either you do it now or you wait 10 years from now and you do it again later, but yep. you've got to do it at some point. And it could be at the worst time, but it's better to do it while you're scraping the bottom than to do it at the very, very top. Yeah, it's one of these things where you're kind of fighting for the soul of the industry. I mean, I know recently <laughs> there's been articles about OpenAI are starting to pitch to Hollywood and they're starting to pitch to studios and talk about what's achievable. I know they've also really been in bed right now with NVIDIA. Recently, there was an article came about about who they were really doing stuff with them as well. And yeah, it's, it's one of these things where, you know... I get where people come to have the argument of like the cat's out of the bag and there's nothing we can do to stop it. But I think like most regulation, especially now in the EU, we have a lot of regulation. So a couple of things have happened recently. So we've got the New York Times lawsuit that's still ongoing. Um, we also have the European Union have just passed an EU law for AI. So it now means that companies have to, within the European Union, disclose where their information, where their data sets come from, because then can it be trained as ethical or unethical. But also talking about Ultraman, where you worked on it. Um, so the person, I think there's no creator who within China owns the IP, he then sued AI because of what was getting produced and China, he won. So China basically legality said that AI is copyright infringement. So they owed royalties to him. So like if we keep getting those kind of mini wins here and there, it will hopefully start to level out into the fact that like we yeah. probably will integrate in some way, but then under the artist jurisdiction, right? It's, it's within our control, within our power. We decide what gets used and doesn't get used. It's less the studios, it's more us because we have the power to create the productions. So yeah, it's definitely one of these things where it's going to happen regardless. Um, but difficult times again, because obviously last year during the strike, a lot of guys I know, like Philip Booty and stuff like that who work for Marvel, like they were really hurting because they were basically living off their savings for six months. And it's really difficult when you build up that reserve and it all just dwindles within a couple of months. So um, it's going to be a really tough time ahead. So, but then again, fighting the good fight nothing never comes easy and i know my father who was an engineer back in the 70s and 80s who was out in the picket lines fighting for sick pay you know like that was a thing we didn't even have back then you know just to be off sick and still get paid for your work and maternity leave you know working our weeks where we only work 40 hours a week like a lot of that stuff all came for european union but also because we stood out in the cold and fought for it so yeah it's just a thing we all I think at one point have to go through in our industry to, to correct because we can't keep giving into the billion and trillionaires and guys like bob Iger who just have infinite money and don't really give a shit and cut down trees so people can stand under the shade. <laughs> yeah. I mean, hey, look, it's it's really just growing pains. Yeah. And, and you know, it's uh history repeats itself. And you look yep. at all the great wars that are fought, they're fought for damn good reason, you know. Yep. And this is a different type of war. It's mm -hmm. definitely an economic social dynamic war yep. that we're gonna all have to band together on and and overcome. So yeah. Yeah. my I feel like we're at a good point right now where if we just keep talking to each other and we keep mm -hmm. staying informed and like you, you're doing your due diligence to learn about all the different, you know, bills that are being passed in government. That's the key, man, is yeah. to just keep looking at those specific signs and yeah. know exactly what those mean. Mm -hmm. And that way you have a, a very good dialogue to, to speak to in the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I think that having these podcasts are super important too, because there are a lot of people that aren't aware of it. Yeah. And, you know, just being aware and having an understanding of some, it doesn't have to be as deep dive as you have, Gordon, like, you know, yeah. it's, it's uh, maybe it's just like the, the skimming the top of the surface. Yeah. But I think that um, it's in a, some ways, I actually like being a little naive. I like being a little incoherent to certain aspects because it keeps me a little bit more positive. Yeah. I find when I go down the rabbit hole too deeply, I can tend to get too caught up in it. 
and yeah. in a way become almost like a conspiracy theorist and yeah, sort of yeah, yeah. solve all the world's mm-hmm. problems. And I think yeah, that's also yeah. something healthy is know when to check out too in order yeah. to save yourself. You know, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, the balance is hard, man. Like, I mean, it my is ADHD brain hard. is just like, it's so wired to just induce oh, yeah. information all the time, um, which makes you a great creative. But like at the same time, I think I need to focus on another thing because I, I watched a talk the other day with uh, Lady Gaga, funny enough, but she was talking about how as a creative if you're not creating constantly and you're kind of sitting in your own space all it does is make your head just go further and further and further and further down the dark rabbit hole like yes. you say then you think of the worst case scenarios you think of the world and what's going to happen with this that and the other thing you need to unleash that energy you have swallowing you in do. your brain into something positive um it, 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 it's, it's called head swell right yeah you know yep it's like a it's a weird thing where your mind starts to sort of bloat and get oversized on one side or you know lopsided and yeah. You know, the, the healthy exercise is to write, you know, to write that stuff down or go yeah. for like an, go for a walk and sort of talk about it with friends and have and sing, make yeah. something. Yeah. 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 I love, I love having community. That's one thing I'll highly encourage any of the listeners is find people that are like-minded and mm-hmm. flock together and discuss these things, have topics to discuss. And I have people I regularly call on a weekly basis and yeah. have these kind of conversations with, and mm-hmm. it's just super healthy. You know, it just, it makes you uh, realize like that we're all in the same boat together. We're all sort of floating in the same ocean. And uh, I look at our industry. I always say this to friends, like we're kind of puddle skipping. And it's like, what does that mean? You look for the wettest puddle and you jump from one puddle to the next in this industry in order to keep jobs and stay afloat. And not all jobs pay the same. Not all of the people that you work with are going to be cool. But if you have something for the time being and it keeps you well and you can still have your community uh, yeah. that's the key it really is yeah. i mean and also like the whole like i mean it's like an echo chamber of for, from my first episode to this episode where we're like 100, we're 100 deep um personal projects yeah. is something that like every single person for nearly eight years has talked about you wow. know nearly 10 years you know it's like you know uh, speaking to ian, ian mckeg you know like the, yeah. the fact that he is now writing and producing short stories and books you know like there's always something in the background like ian talks about star wars you know vividly of like oh it was a great time i really enjoyed my time there but he then is always so focused on like what he's doing, like what, you know, yeah. he works for contract, he works for these studios, but then like, what is he doing as a person? What's his legacy he's going to leave behind? And uh, I think like a lot of that has been outreach stuff where like either it's with THU or schoolism, like he's getting yeah. to the minds of like students. He likes, you know, meeting people, young people especially, and trying to inform them about like what they should really like and how we get through it and stay positive. Because Ian, you know, he's yeah. just like, he, he was born without that part of his brain that makes him sad. Like it's just, yeah, just like, he's just infectious to be ray of sunshine. So, um, yeah. but yeah, so it's one of these things, personal projects. But then, like, you know, for you, you what you were doing built into a project that you know, built from personal into work. Yeah. You know, and Blue Eyed Samurai, I think, was like, you know, I, I think you've talked about this with, with Mattia, obviously. But like, what was the origin of those paintings? Was it just something like you were doing to decompress from work? What you were doing at the time? No. Um. So when I was in college, funny enough, you mentioned this. I've I've always I'm obsessed, as you've seen, I've seen with uh, my personal work with samurais, mm-hmm. and I have a right. story I wrote. It was mostly an outline. Yeah. And um, I met a friend named Tim Kaluk and mm-hmm. uh, Jonathan Ryder, and I said, hey, would you guys like to work on this story with me? And I read mm-hmm. it to them. I showed them all my visuals I was crafting still in college. Mm-hmm. And they're like, yeah, dude, let's make this thing. And so in the background, while we were in school, while we we're in our personal lives and in our careers, we kept working on it. And, and both of them got really busy. So I was the only one that sort of kept going on it. Right. But it was my ideas, my brain trust to sort of come up with the story. And all these visuals that you've been seeing in my work, my personal work, are right. just me testing the style. Right. And so I was like, hey, how do I keep the style evolving? And so it started mm-hmm. off like very concept already. Mm-hmm. And then after a while, I was like, hey, I like going more graphic with this. I like woodcut. I like woodblock yeah. and I was looking at um, Yoshida and I was looking at a lot of like manga stuff, like um, even uh, and all the like the the most important stuff to me is always the stuff where I feel like I'm it's speaking to me. Yeah. And I, I wasn't looking at any uh, animation stuff. I was looking at art, like real like background mm. painting and, stuff, and right. stuff that you were seeing in, in museums and saying, hey, how do I take the best of that and make something into a movie? Right. And so the idea for this project for it's called Yamamoto. That's the project I've been working on is uh, is a story about my brother and I. And it's the story about two people that basically I want to say anything specific because I, I am pitching it. Yeah, yeah working on. Um, yeah, it's it's basically uh, the story of two people that split apart and then come back together. That's basically right, okay. it. 
And um, there's a reason why, you know, there's like a huge uh, rift that happens in between. Mm -hmm. And it's like the typical protagonist, antagonist, hero's journey, you know, kind of thing. But the visuals have always been in my head. It's a crazy thing. I don't know if this happens to you, Gordy, but Mm -hmm. I'm dreaming and I wake up and it's like almost like a fever dream where it's still in my mind. Mm -hmm. And then I'll start painting it out. And I have this really strange uh, sort of like visual um, library in my head of different types of shapes and and Mm -hmm. like textures. Mm -hmm. And that's what all those paintings are. They're visual shapes and textures that I got to get out. It's you literally just a little, little bit of like exercising the demons a bit. Yeah, you literally just the thing you just said. I just watched an interview with James Cameron when he talked oh. about because he's just put out a book and he's also doing an art show in Paris where he's shown off his work from like Alien and stuff all the way back to like the paintings yeah. and he's done. Um, and he talks about the exact same thing: how he will wake up from dreams and sit and draw and paint things he's just like seen in his vision. And that's I think that was some of the early stuff that came up for Alien. That's where he got a lot of those early xenomorph stuff involves so like yeah like i think it's a very if you're i mean lucid dreaming something i've seen george and a couple other paintings i've met who are like the old school painters who used to do who engage in lucid dreaming mostly because they felt their dreams were so vivid they wanted to capture them as much as they could um you know and george harrison I mean, he definitely done that painting where like with the moon's crashing into the earth and that was always kind of really famous at the time but like yes yeah, it's, it's a thing of like i think it's is it aphasia you know the thing that people have where like if you tell them to picture an apple in their head some people yeah. can't do that like they can't even think of a pic that's like a blank space it's like they have to almost verbalize what they're thinking but for me i can almost create entire worlds people talking voices like my mm-hmm. brain sometimes works on that level and i'm thinking also almost like is that the level you have to be sometimes to be at the echelon you're at where you're you know you have those like high level like thoughts and feelings within your dreams that you bring into reality um it's it's, it's quite a deep question obviously but like i feel like if you're up subconsciously or unconsciously thinking of art within your mind yeah. how does that translate into real world stuff it's it's a hard dynamic to shift across because how do you paint what you see in your mind it's it's definitely true because there's um it's it's a it's sort of a savant thing that happens i i noticed this with my dad too because my dad mm-hmm. is really great at storytelling right and he loves sci-fi. So I was always listening to him talk about, you know, his books that he's read, like 2001 Space Odyssey and a lot of the Stephen King novels and stuff. But um, yeah. specifically, uh, sitting in an environment, I remember these days of just sitting in my backyard, looking at a tree mm-hmm. and just watching light move through the trees onto the like branches. Right. I would, stories would just start popping into my head. Yeah. And it's a weird thing that happens to visual people where mm-hmm. they're they're sort of feeling, touching it's visceral and it's this connection to their environment and to their craft Mm -hmm. and creating. And, you know, as an artist, if you, it's, it's a lifetime of discovery. You're, you're, you're fully invested in this. It's it's not a job. It's never been a job to me. It's about who I am. It's my, it's literally in my DNA. Identity. Yeah. You know, and people love that and they see it and they want to work with people that have that kind of passion for what they do. Yeah. And, you know, there's the, there's the greats of our, of our lifetime, like the James mm-hmm. Camerons and mm-hmm. people that are creating these like magnum opus stories that they yeah. want to like craft into this something. And it takes time to get there. And you just got to be patient with yourself. Like I love what I w- really love about Dennis Villeneuve is he's like starting to come into the limelight. Finally. Yeah. Um, June was I, incredible. Yeah. I've, I've been, you know, watching him since like way before Dune. Oh, since Serpico for me. Yeah. Yeah. Since Serpico, yes. Yeah. And my favorite film actually is still Arrival. Like mm. from him. And um, Shit, I like the visual the, language in that. Wow, yeah, it's stunning, and it and it's like simplified in a way, and the storytelling and the way it all ties together at the end. He is exactly like in a way. He I've heard interviews with him, and he talks about how he actually crafts shots from dreams too. And mm-hmm. I actually heard that there's a scene in um they went they stayed in the desert after the filming of Dune One, right? And he just sat in the environment, and he was talking about how he was just letting the mountains speak to him. And how the light was moving over the mountains and saying, oh, hey, indeed. that's a shot. Let's shoot that. Like, we, yeah, I have my wow. crew here. Let's start shooting this. Yeah. And that was all B-roll. A lot of the stuff, you know, with the eclipse and, yeah. you know, seeing all, that's all practical. It was all shot on location. Yeah. And it's because they spent time there. And in yeah. order for something to become a masterpiece and in order for something to be great, you have to spend mm-hmm. time with it. You can't rush that process. Yeah. And I think that that's why in a way, Blue Eye Samurai was born. And I'm not trying to float my own boat, but no, no, no. Jane, Jane messaged me um, 
when I first started working on the project, Jane Wu, she was the supervising director. Now she's the EP. Yes. Um, and she's like, I got to be honest with you. I, with my pitch deck, it's all your work. And I mm -hmm. go, Whoa, I didn't know it's a, it was kind of flattering, but also kind of like, yeah. I didn't know that you were using my work to pitch this project to oh, the studio. Yeah. So it was like kind of like a backhanded compliment. Yeah. But at the same time, I was like, okay, I can get down with that. Let's uh, hire a team around this. And, mm -hmm. you know, Yun, I don't know if you know who Yun Ling is, but Yun, no. Yun was an artist on Spider-Verse and he works okay. very specifically with Alberto Maeglo. Um, okay. And he, he did a lot of the Love, Death and Robots, The Witness and, yeah, no, Albert. Yeah, 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 yeah. and Jabaro and stuff like that. And um, yeah, yeah. and so Yun and I are old friends. We we got, we met on the Saijun forums back in the day when like Craig Mullins <laughs> was doing speed paintings with Vile and Jesus. all those guys. and. Back so, you know, that's, I'm from that um, same thinking where I'm like, hey, let's, all the people I love, I admire, mm -hmm. and I'm inspired by, I'm going to hire them one day. Mm -hmm. And that was the first project I got a chance to do that, where I was like, I'm going to grab everybody from every facet, even Naomi Baker, who went on to work at Marvel, Marvel mm -hmm. with Carla and stuff. Like, mm -hmm. Naomi was like, I was a fan. I was like, oh my God, her, her drawings of characters have so much emotions to them. Yeah, she's she designed Mizu. Like the yeah, reason yeah, why yeah, Mizu yeah. is Mizu is fucking Naomi Baker and yeah, Wayne yeah. Johnson, who was a teacher at Art Center and yeah. an amazing illustrator. I was like, I gotta get him on this project to design characters. Mm -hmm. Like all Ringo, that's his character. Like yeah. Ringo was designed by Wayne, and Swordfather yeah. is is Wayne. Mm -hmm. And so I had all these these ideas in my head mm -hmm. of these characters, and I but we had lots of conversations without the showrunners there without the director there and talked about all these things. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I left the show because yeah. there was, there was a, a lot of um, deferring personalities in it. I mm -hmm. won't go into detail, yeah. but it was, it was, sort of, I, I was tor tormented by the thought of leaving, mm -hmm. but I had to, to preserve my sanity. And it was yeah. during the worst time of my life and mm -hmm. people in my family were really sick and it was mm -hmm. during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So I was like, this is the best thing I can do at this possible time. Yeah, but I'm so glad that people realize that it was my work. I'm, yeah, that, to me, that makes me super happy that even though they didn't give me the Annie Award, I was nominated, but I wasn't mm -hmm. given the Annie Award for the show. Mm -hmm. I know that that's my Annie Award. You know, yeah, yeah. like I don't need to, you know, tell anybody that. They, everybody knows that. It's like one of those things where you could walk away from it and hold your head high and be like, "That was a really good experience. I learned so much from it." We don't do these things for the accolades anyway. We do them for the the feeling of creating something and giving something a lasting meaning in the world. And thank you for saying that. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and and like me and Ian have talked about this a couple of times. And Ian was like very like you think like me, Gordon, when I said to him once that you know Ian, I just want to like leave the world a little brighter than I found it. And he was like, same, yeah. So and it's one of these things that so that, special. I mean that that's like you know George making Star Wars. Like think of them in a scientists doctors engineers artists especially that have formed their whole lives and careers around one thing that he created you know and people might look to your show because i've been so well received obviously you know and look at it down the line as like the standard for how you make animated series in the future you know what i mean and that's because of things you've done the, the 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 giants that crafted the mountains you know as we talk about back in the day we old old norse but like yeah that's the thing like that you can now think of and God damn it, if I don't want you to get involved in working on a Star Wars Visions short at one point, because I think it would be fucking incredible. Oh my God, that would be uh, so sick. I, yeah. I'm, I'm such a fan of those. And man, you know, the art books. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's such a cool thing to talk to you because I feel like, you know, I don't really know you and I feel like we've known each other for years and yeah. there's a certain... I'm very easy to talk to, Jason. You'll find this mile. I'll explain this as well. <laughs> I, I feel like I should just confide everything to you. I, yeah. I have this... Uh, this strong feeling that we're going to come back to it. We're going to have a, a lot of rebirth and animation. There's mm -hmm. going to be another renaissance. Uh, I'm very excited about the future. I think uh, people are going to like have their minds bent once they see Ultraman and, yep. and they see Transformers and, you know, not everything has to be Spider-Verse. Yeah, you know? of course. And, and that's, yeah. that's cool. Like I'm all about that. Anything. Yeah. It's you not can a lot do good for us. New, yeah. new feel, a new texture, yep. a new dynamic for uh, do it because people want to see different stuff. Mm -hmm. And you know, at, at first, maybe people will be like, that's ugly, mm -hmm. you know, and then, uh, and then let it sit with them, let it resonate. Yeah. And they'll be like, Oh, my God, that's actually super interesting. Okay. There's a lot, yeah. there's a lot of new stuff being told here. Mm -hmm. So have a, you know, a new perspective and a point of view. I think that's so important. I love that. Yeah. Man. 
Yeah, I think also it's one of these things that you talk about, like the ease of talk, but it's like a thing where I've now discovered, I've been doing this long enough now, but like, you know, you get caught up in the stuff about, oh, you know, what brush do you use? What pencil do you use? Yeah. But the thing that I think has evolved, and when I talked to Lauren Lanning about this, and he was, you know, really encompassing the things I was talking about, is that it's like, I think I tried to get to the root of what makes people want to be artists and what is the human element in the room. You know, we talk about the human, the person behind the artwork, and I think that's more important sometimes than, it is. you know, like, like, here's the pencil to buy, here's the brush pack to buy. No, 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 like, what do you want to create? What speaks to you down in your soul? When you look at the backyard, at the tree in your backyard, what does that encourage you to make in the world? Like, that's yeah. the stuff that I want students to take away from this is that, because some people get caught up in like, you know, they're, you know, bearing their soul to the industry and, and, and getting so burnt out in it. But it's like, you really have to connect with you as a person, as an artist. You'll go work for people, sure, but you should always be creating for you. you the the yes. thing that comes back to the base is that you should be making the things you want to make. You take your jobs, you take your money, you do your job really well, you make connections and friendships, but then at the end of the day, you come back and you make things for yourself. That's the biggest thing. Right takeaway you have to really have in this industry so yeah and you'll still want to do and you learn on that process like yamamoto for me mm -hmm. uh was my training grounds and in a, in a way like i've done a lot of the same work that i was doing in professional setting before yeah. it was like a lot of it's like a lot of a similar story aesthetics a lot of similar thinking mm -hmm. dynamics and everything was sort of there already and and yeah. sort of pre almost ordained or predestined and I love that. I love when that kind of moment happens. It's like, oh my God, I've been here before. I yeah. kind of get this already. And and you understand what to do. And I love what you just said about how, you know, you're giving people those same, you know, that those pieces and those tidbits of yourself mm -hmm. and people can see that and they know that you love it. And if you see someone, I'm a firm believer in this. If you see a piece and you could tell someone had fun when they were creating it, mm -hmm. whether it's a, a story moment or a character or an object, that piece is so much more pleasing to look at. You could you could sit there and stare at it for hours and study it because you're like, look, that person, there was so much fun in that. And it could have been created in a few minutes. It could have been created over a course of a couple of days or months or years. But it's something people will marvel over forever, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's one of these things why I have like artwork in my studio that's not just like, it's all concept art. You know, like I have paintings by guys like Chris Guest, who's a London painter. You're like Because like, I like people who express on canvas. I think it's really yes. important as well with brushwork. Like, the way people just touch paper with a brush like that is part of you extending through the brush into the paper like and that's right. it's something that i think you can bring to your work as a entertainment designer what i really call people like us but um but traditional artists the guys who really like who you know make no money who really sometimes live on the streets and have nothing to their name who then pick up a canvas and, and bear their soul onto a piece of a4 like it's it's yeah it's powerful stuff and i think it's that's the stuff you have to draw from outside of the industry because you know you've got your name McCaig's you've got your Scott Robertson's but then you know you want to try and bring that unique vision and that's what makes your your voice so unique and why yes. where you you really bring your style into things where people can see oh I see your influence of this here and the influence of this artist but I've never really seen like this color palette or like this brushwork where does this come from like and then you can dive deeper into well this painter this artist this charcoal guy that I know you know like those are the things that then when you produce stuff at like portfolio reviews people will be like holy shit and if they've never seen it before they'll instantly jump in it and be like i mean to hire this guy i mean to hire this now look at it look at this stuff it's incredible you know so that's the more important thing is like bringing your voice to the table versus like trying because i mean like feng just took portfolio reviews at imag in paris and every single one was little person big building little person big building and he was like where is the storytelling? Where is the mechanics of what you're doing? Like, where is your voice and your work? Like, what, you know, because Art Station for so long was just a copy paste thing for many, many years. People making yeah. the same stuff over and over again. Yeah. Um, I just talked about this with a couple of guys and they were saying the same thing about how it's almost kind of poisoned the industry in a, in a sense from people, younger people now that are coming through school. You know what I mean? And then you respond, Jason. <laughs> yeah, I'm, just, yeah. I'm just thinking about what you said because yeah, you know, it's a lot. It's a lot to take in. Yeah, it's the no, whole I thing mean, of yeah. I, I I do portfolio reviews on a weekly basis, and uh -huh. I do see that where there's moments, and I'm like, I kind of I had a pause there because I was thinking mm -hmm. about what you said about Fang. Yeah. Um, I recently listened to one of his talks he did on YouTube, and I think the AI he, one talking about the AI. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And um he's right you know it's there's there's a lot of things that you know we do when we're getting closer sort of quarters in a medium shot where mm -hmm. that you that's where you see the real thinking 
Yeah. Um, I don't think it's bad that you could you show scale in a piece. Mm -hmm. I, I'm kind of the opposite of thing. Like I like seeing pieces like that in a portfolio. Right. Scale yeah. is not easy to do. To do a mm -hmm. big establishing shot and make it look correct, where yeah. all the textures are in the right place and all the scales and proportions and perspective are in the right place, mm -hmm. and you're making the atmosphere feel correct and all that stuff. That's mm -hmm. a very masterful thing to do. It goes back to the old Hudson River School master painters, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. And so you know, and Bierstadt and all those amazing painters from the classical days. Yeah. That stuff is hard, but also yeah, yeah. the harder thing for me to do is tell a story, an yes. image. And you know, if you're telling a story of like two people in a confrontation mm -hmm. without showing that they're in a confrontation, yeah, that's the kind of that's the tension that you want to create. Body language, facial expression, yeah, yeah, and it, and a lot of that is crafted through composition. A lot of it is done through lighting. A lot of it's it is by placing objects inside of a scene and creating a metaphor with all lighting. those objects in the scene. Yeah. Yeah. One's red, one's blue. You know, so yeah. yeah. No, I think it was, mm -hmm. Sorry. Ed. No, I was going to say, I think the thing with Feng as well is that he was trying to say was that those things are great, but it's not the whole piece. It's not the whole thing that, like, that's not the, no. you know, because I yes. think the job of concept design has been muddled. And the fact that people think that's all you do as a concept designer, it's a lot of those blue sky pieces versus like a gun or a, you know, a yes. piece of armor or something like a character turnaround. Like, how do we build these things in 3D or how do they function? How does it reload? You know, like that stuff that you have to figure out early yes. and the then put in production. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we do that in animation. Um, I, I we call it sequence design. Mm -hmm. And what we do is like, say for example, we do these high level paintings. Mm -hmm. that, that's like the blue sky, pop, you know, point, point of it. Yeah. And we go, hey, this is where you know the main character is. This is the space. It, this is textually lit this way. And mm -hmm. you start creating maps around those big blue skies. Yeah. And then you show that to the director. Make sure all the scales feeling right. Then you do a mm -hmm. rough build. A lot of my mm -hmm. art department people are are. Um, digital art department, they can mm. paint and draw, they can do 3D models. Right. So we'll, we'll, we'll rough stuff out in 3D, get the visual sort of scale of everything. It doesn't have to be finished. Yeah. Just boxes and cubes in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Show it to the director. They love the scale. You get real lenses in there with your scout, you know, doing mm -hmm. your previs. Mm -hmm. And I talk with my cinematographer on my movie a lot where we're mm -hmm. actually like, hey, this feels right. Maybe this, you know, counter feels too low or this dwarf doesn't feel tall enough. And if you're, you know, in a world where things are stretched or proportions are sort of elaborated, you have to build around that. So there's so many, you know, backs and forths and sort of little uh, digestive pieces that you need to know. Now, if I'm doing work for myself and, mm -hmm. you know, I want to just have fun, I'm all, I'm all good about just landscape painting. Yeah, you know, yeah. That's, that, that's sort of like me going, like at the end of the day, just kind of yeah, like, yeah. like I want to just do a lighting exercise on some rocks or, you huh. know. But if you want me to get that into latest piece the nitty recently, you've done a lot of the painting of the, the forest. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and if you want to get down into the nitty gritty of it, I can. Like I can yeah. get down and design a mech. I can, you mm -hmm. know, I, I'm hard. I can do hard surface design as well. I do organic design. And I think that I don't put a lot of that stuff in my book. And yeah. it's, it's interesting because you said something that you hit the nail right on the head. I don't want to be hired for that. You yeah. know, if, if someone brings me in to do like a whole industrial like warehouse, I wouldn't be yeah. happy. You know, I'd be like, okay, I'll do it. You know, mm -hmm. it'll look awesome. I'll make it as, as amazing as I possibly can. But there's a dude that does that out there every single day and that's their bread and butter. Hire that yep. guy. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. If you want me to do like a samurai tail, I'm mm -hmm. down, you know, or yeah. if you want me to do transformers and make a new world out of something and create something totally unique in a landscape around Cybertron. Yeah. I'm down. Like that's, I like love world building. So yeah. You know, I think I like the greater challenge, and I think that people will see that in your work if you inject that into yourself. Yes. But breaking things down into small shapes from a bigger world, that's the crafting, that's the world building. That's the the Tolkien, you know, that's the, you know, the Game of Thrones thinking. And I think yeah, that's yeah. super amazing. And I just feel like there's so much more story to tell and worlds yeah. to create out there. I'm very excited yeah. about it. Yeah, definitely. And I think a good point to end on there, uh, Jason, I think we've, we've kind of hit the nail on the head is that yeah, do what you love, uh, and then you'll you'll get to do what you love. You know, I mean, that's the thing is that you'll just yeah, indeed. Not a doubt. Oh, yeah. Indeed. Um, so yeah, for anybody who stuck around to this point, thank you very much for listening. Yeah. Um, it's been a, a great talk. I hope you've enjoyed it, Jason, and thank you for coming on. Gordy, I it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time today as well and reaching out to me. Yeah. Um, if you ever want to chat out in the future, I'm always down for like a part two or part three. I always like doing that with friends. And yep. uh, please invite me back. I'd love to chat with you more. Yeah, grand. Thank you very much, Jason. Awesome. It's an honor to have you on. So, um, 
yeah so uh again yeah if you guys have stuck to this point uh you can check out jason's work at the links below i'll leave all his stuff in the description if you want to reach out or even check out what he's doing um again transformers will be coming out at one point very soon so check that out also and of course blue-eyed samurai that he's worked on previously um a lot of awesome stuff that jason has touched uh, throughout the last couple of years and uh yeah thanks again to you guys for listening thanks for jason for coming on again and we'll see you all there bye guys thank you bye